few customers. I think we want to start with just um, what it means to identify a business problem and how to approach that when actually beginning to tackle it. So I think uh, I'd like to start with Lilac. And what do you think it means to have a business summary actually focus on a problem? What it means is your ability to make money. So your ability to, to bring value to a customer to a point that they'll pay for the value that you bring to them. Typically, you do that by solving a problem, either that the customer is aware they have or that they're not even aware that they have that problem. But either way, you're filling a void that a consumer is willing to pay for. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that I hear that makes all my flat red flags go up is when someone says, well, you know, we'll build it and they will come. You know, we've all heard that. And so I think if you're a technology focused person, it's really easy to think, I just have this really, really cool thing. And I know if I get it out there, you know, people will just come flock to it. And I mean, nothing is further from the truth. I mean, it's, you really kind of start the sales side, but how am I going to sell this? Who's going to buy it? What will they pay for it? And then you really, you know, work backwards, as you're saying, towards the product itself. And they have to meet in the middle. They have to come together. So you have to ask yourself, well, what would I, you know, if I was a buyer, what would I pay for it? Especially if you have a consumer product, you should kind of know, really ask your, the hard question, would I pay for this and how much would I pay for it? And not that this is just a really cool thing. Someone surely will buy it. And, and please don't take the cost of goods multiplied by three yeah. and call it your price. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of can get buried in the development, making it better, making it perfect. And rather than because it allows you to hide from that reality of whether or not it's really going to sell. And it's it's kind of fun to hide from the reality, right, <laughs> when you're building this thing. So well, and also it's tough when you're an entrepreneur, often you're by yourself. And if you do your job right, you talk, you talk to a lot of customers and they all tell you, oh, that would be cool. And right. this would be cool. Right. This would, Nobody said no to me. To keep the, <laughs> the product very simple right. and to not get influenced by right. whoever talk, you talk to. I would say, yeah, build less and try and force yourself to go out and sell this less, you know, that minimum viable product and get some money for it because that's all that counts and is look, money. And look for the naysayers. You'd rather hear it early and you'd rather hear it from a, um, a nice person that you're not asking money for, right? Because then you go, oh, I hadn't thought about that. You come up with an answer so that when a potential investor asks you that same question, that same bubble popping question, you actually have a response. Uh, oh, we do it all the time, all the time. Oh, the question was, how does the concept of MVP, uh, a minimal viable product, apply in medical devices where it would save lives? Well, the answer is you don't use it on humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can show how a medical device works. And actually, at the Health Innovation Challenge, quite a few um, guys showed that. Companies showed that quite well on models, on uh, different things. But you can you can mock up anything you just can't use it on humans. I've seen people use it on themselves. I don't know how the FDA would react to that, but typically yeah. typically, you, you, you just don't show it on humans. You could also um, target out what your um, endpoints would be, similar to if it be an actual clinical endpoint or an engineering or bioengineering endpoint, and then do enough to actually accomplish that task. So that's usually what happens with the different iterations of prototype design. You usually have an initial prototype to demonstrate some novel concept. And then after that concept is demonstrated, you iterate the product to incorporate more features. But you got to always target the, the MVP standpoint. For our device, we're working on a universal auto injector. Our minimal endpoint would just be to deliver a specific, specific amount of um, liquid <laughs> medication. And so we're taking an engineering endpoint and we're developing that into further clinical endpoints. How have, you, how have you guys approached market sizing? What have you found that that really means? And can you share a little bit about what that process has been like for you guys? So market sizing is a very important topic. Um, they say for business plans, um, the market and the finances are usually um, important concepts for your investors. But for market sizing, you could think of it as a funnel for example, our device is a medical device targeting um, users of the EpiPen, which are um, 
users of a medication that prevents or reduces the outcomes of anaphylaxis. So when we wanted to market size this problem, we had to consider the different geographic locations, different population subsets. But basically, you have a funnel that filters down the specific amount. I guess the most relevant example that's easy to, to explain would be um, pediatric versus adult dosing for medications like the EpiPen. There's uh, two different markets. There's um, markets for adults and there's markets for um, children. And so you can take the prevalence of a certain disease state and you can um, map it out on a global level, then by a country level, and then by a population level, and then by a user level. And then you can connect that with who your buyers or your sellers would be, whether you're pursuing a B2B or a B2C model. When you know your entire market size, how do you go about projecting how much of a share that you want to have? I know people say, oh, I, can just... I was going to say, <laughs> you make stuff up. <laughs> and we kind of hate to see those. I know. I, we know they're the BS. worst thing when we see know, those yeah. in yeah. business plans. Yeah. I but what's better? You, you, you want to show <laughs> enough that you're, you, you show the potential is big, but you don't want to use a high number that somebody looks at it and goes, oh, this person's crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Right. So you try and make things look modest. Well, if I only factor half of a percent of this giant market, I'm still making $100 million a year. I, I'm just making up numbers. So you want to appear conservative in your estimates. So is the percentage estimate fair? You, you typically show it growing, right? You show it year after year after year. Um, and you build a model based on certain assumptions. You just need to be clear on those assumptions and try and appear conservative with each one of, with each assumption. And yeah. Another way to justify it, although it, it's probably uh, not always accurate, is to take an empirical number and work backwards. So let's say, what would the 1% represent in terms of number of customers? So mm -hmm. let's say a thousand. What would it take for me to get a thousand customers? Mm -hmm. uh, it would probably take for me at six months to be at that stage and then at three months to be at that stage. And then you can at least explain to your investors or whoever you're talking to why you chose that particular percentage. What are some of the tools or most effective um, methods you found with respect to customer discovery? Um, so you can, be, you can build surveys uh, and uh, try to stick to your survey. So the, the advantage in building a questionnaire before you go talk to someone is that it's standardized you asking the same question to everyone. And also you can control what you're telling them. You can not give too much away about your idea and not necessarily for IP reasons, but if you give too much away about your idea, you're kind of biasing the questions from the get-go. So the, the first step in trying to understand your customer is trying to understand the market without talking to them about your product. Is get it, it's, a, it's kind of an art getting there and uh, you can get help from people who've done it before, because it's not easy to uh, pose the questions in a way that you know for sure you're gonna get an answer that is not biased. And so that's the first step. When you understand the customer very well, then you can go back and then have questions a little bit more directed toward what is your product going to address and what type of problem it's solving and whether they would be interested in it. And then as a third step, you can test your pricing idea if you have one. The other thing that is very important is talk to Follow the money. So talk to whoever is going to spend money to buy your product, but also, who, and you talked about that, I like, is who is important in the decision-making process? So for example, if you uh, develop a medical device, maybe it's the doctor making the decision to buy for the hospital, uh, but the customer is the hospital, but you need to talk to all of these people. You need to talk about the, to the, the procurement people at the hospital. What does it take to get a product ordered? Uh, do they need for the product to be reimbursed? You know, if so, what does that mean? Uh, if it's the doctor, uh, is it the doctor by himself or is it the doctor when the customer, the patient asks for it or the nurse? So you have to understand the whole ecosystem and who are the influencers and who are going to influence the decision because your product is going to have to, add your, your marketing and your sales and your customer discovery process is going to have to address all of these aspects. Quickly say that customer discoveries. Uh, at first, when I tried it, it's a fairly abstract concept because I got it mixed up with um, market validation. But I just wanted to um, stress some of the 
the key points, which were to um, you have to frame your questions the right way so that you're always um, probing for more information. So it's always good to use like um, open ended questions and um, just really want to just um, emphasize that um, she was very right. It's, it's also about um, finding and following where the money is, because um, in the end, it's not so transparent who's actually buying your product versus who's actually using your product, Sp especially relevant for the medical device market, because um, you know the doctors, they'll advocate for your product, but it might be like a whole committee that orders the, the product, but in the end, there'll be the patients that use the product. But basically, um, these are pretty abstract concepts. Um, I'd say it's really helpful to to learn more about these concepts and starting with a Google search or some YouTube videos or more formal programs like the, the iCorps or the ZAP program that's also based at the UW's uh, co-motion offices would be a good start and a good way to find more resources. And if I may add to that, um, face-to-face -face interviews, especially in the early stages, are way better than surveys uh, because then you can see the body language rather than the answer. Um, and also look for the no, don't look for the yes. Avoid being defensive, find out why. Why, what is their real problem? What are the challenges? So welcome the no's and welcome the pushbacks more than the, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, and, and then maybe eventually they're not willing to pay for it, like in that great example that you used. So getting negative and getting pushback, just don't be defensive. So which of the, how do you know which route to pursue or who, where to really build the business model around? Is it for the customer who says, I want that? Or is it around the doctor or the hospital administrator who's ready to check? And sometimes it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. But uh, very often for medical devices, the patient doesn't know. So it really depends on your product. Sometimes you also have to convince the, the user and the real customer on top of the influencers for this one, it was not safe. You, you need to find a champion. Right. So mm -hmm. you could have a primary champion, a secondary champion. You might be surprised, actually, who your real champion would be is probably someone who you may not think of. But you got to understand who, what is the type of person that will be driving the decision and the purchasing and implementation. So when you guys are mapping out um, like who to target, um, it, it really depends. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, I will say that um, a good approach would be to start identifying if it's going to be a consumer good or a business good. Because um, say you were in a totally different industry, um, if it were a B2C angle, you could try to get more um, customer um, involvement, do like a direct to consumer marketing campaign. But if it's more of a B2B angle, you really got to target the, the buyers and the key opinion leaders because they're going to be the ones that ultimately um, drive this, the yes or the no. One of those soapbox I tell all students I work with, which is you will only be a student for this period of time. Use it where you can get on the phone. I mean phone, not text mm -hmm. or email. And you can call someone. You can say, I am a ex business student at the University of Washington. I am studying X. I would like to come and talk to you, Howard Schultz. <laughs> about starting a coffee company or whatever. I mean, honestly, you can call anybody, anybody. And I, I say this to everybody who's a student. When you graduate, you're just the same as everybody else. You have nothing. You're nobody. So right now you have something that is very, very valuable. It's a, it's a free pass. So I would encourage you to do a lot of that do as much as you can make time to do as part of this process and as part of your career development and your education. Because, I mean, the door slams shut when you leave. Seattle is a different uh, place in the world or in the U.S. at least compared to the Bay Area or to the East Coast, for example. People are very open, open to talk to anyone here, even CEOs or executives. You can call them and ask them for coffee for 10 minutes. Yep. I've done it when I was. That's awesome. So that's what Terry also reminded me that I always talk about this is the, uh, the power of networking. And so and in Seattle, it's particularly true because you can call anyone and ask them for coffee and they say yes most of the time. So in the medical device realm, sometimes when you do want to talk to that um, patient segment, 
when you hear each of those talk to patient advocacy groups, I really only know if it's like cancer or some rather extreme chronic disease. How do you find people to talk to or do you have any advice for patient populations that are far more, I guess I'll use the word ordinary, even though it's not fair, but like just talking to folks with less severe? Family and friends. Start with family and friends in your network. I mean, there's nothing like it. Um, I'll, I'll use hypertension. I don't know. First thing that popped to mind. Put on Facebook. I, I don't know if your generation is on Facebook. I hear now it's just for old people. So uh, on Facebook, hey, I'm doing a research study on hypertension. I'm looking for 10 people to talk to. Uh, PM me or DM me if, uh, if you know someone. Friends and family. Friends and family. It's it's these days. It's a lot bigger network than it used to be. Uh, same on LinkedIn. The same on uh, um, on other uh, whatever platforms. It depends on. Also, it depends if it's a disease state that people are comfortable talking about versus things that they're not comfortable talking about. Uh, I would approach that differently. Uh, the other thing is to find local uh, doctors that. Uh, can tell you whether there are some patients that would be interested in talking to you. And then you give them a piece of paper that says, if you're interested, contact me. You can't contact them. There's HIPAA laws and, and the doctor will never give you that kind of information. Um, when it comes to surveys, looking at the cancer the focus group, getting information from your end customer, what's the best way to incentivize notification? Do you need to pay people? Do you no. Smile. Just smile. That's what I was going to say. Just smile. <laughs>